Hey guys, good evening and thanks for checking out the Ironman 70.3 Western Massachusetts course info, tips and tricks and Q&A. Big thanks to all of those who have submitted questions over the last several days. So uh, a bunch of those are already going to be answered here within the presentation. Um, so I will get to as many of those as possible at the end uh, as time allows. If I am not able to get to your question this evening, I will respond and follow up to you via email in the next couple of days. If you have any questions now, or uh, if you have any throughout the presentation, you can submit those via that go to webinar widget that is there on your screen. There is a questions tab, so just submit there. And again, I will get to as many of those as possible and follow up uh, with, uh, with the balance of those that I am not able to. But uh, I know you guys are tapering triathletes. You guys need your beauty rest. Um, so I'm not going to uh, keep you any later uh, than we've already committed to this evening. My name is John Mayfield. I have the privilege of being a full-time triathlon coach. I'm extremely passionate about working with athletes and uh, what I get to do as, as my job. I am certified by USA Triathlon at level two, as well as Ironman U. And I've had the honor of coaching hundreds of athletes from first timers to professionals and everyone in between. I work exclusively with long course athletes. So those that are racing 70.3 in Ironman distance events. And uh, what I want to do this evening is just share some of my experience as a coach and an athlete with you to help increase your confidence and reduce your stress so that you can have your best performance and really enjoy this special event uh, that uh, you are in store for. So a couple things before the race gets started. Uh, there are going to be a couple things I'm going to be talking about this evening that uh, I have found to be of, of critical importance uh, in, in really having a good race and really uh, achieving the potential that you have earned through all of your training. And, and one of those key aspects is hydration. It is critical that you arrive at the start line with a good level of hydration and then continue to maintain uh, your, your hydration throughout the race. So uh, it is, as mentioned, it's very important to um, be paying attention to uh, your hydration level leading into the race. So my recommendation is to have uh, a water bottle or something like that with you at all times in those last couple of days leading into the race, preferably something with electrolytes or uh, an electrolyte tab in there. So um, whatever works for you, but uh, make sure that you are staying up on your hydration. Limit time on your feet. So uh, you are going to be spending a lot of time on your legs, using your legs on race day. So uh, just be aware of that and cognizant of that in the days leading into the race. So um, you have those certain things that you have to do in the days leading in. So uh, your check-in, shopping in the Ironman Village, day before checking out, uh, checking in your, your bike. So a couple things that you have to do, there's going to be some walking involved with that, but, uh, just managing time on your feet, not overdoing it, staying up on those recovery modalities that, uh, you've, you've hopefully been, uh, been, been utilizing things like massage, compression, uh, recovery boots, all that kind of stuff. Stick with that, uh, leading into the race. Check out the race course. So uh, maybe maybe outside of those locals that live in the area and, and, and have had the opportunity to uh, train on the course, this is going to be new for, for basically everyone. Brand new race. Um, so it's going to be important to know what you're in store for. Um, especially this bike course is, is a little bit technical. Um, I wouldn't say very technical, very hilly, but, but definitely has uh, a few hills to it and a, and a couple of technical areas. And I, I can say that, but, uh, we all have a different definition and interpretation of what those things mean, what, what hilly or, or technical means. So I always recommend going out and putting eyes on as much of the race course as possible. We don't want any surprises on race day. So actually go out there and see what it is that you're in store for. See uh, how long these climbs are, how steep they are. What are the descents like? Where are the turns? Where are the aid stations in relation to those turns? So again, no surprises on race day. The more information you have, the better you're going to be able to execute on, on race day. So go out and drive the bike course, um, maybe spend some time on your bike for a section of the course, but do what you need to do to, to see as much of that course 
if not the entire course, um, as possible. And then, uh, most of the run course is along paths there in the, in the, in the, uh, kind of downtown area. So maybe get in a run on a portion of the course, maybe ride, uh, a portion of the course, uh, as well. But, uh, again, just get a feel for exactly what it is, uh, you're in store for, uh, several days out from the race. Generally the aid stations are marked on the road with brightly colored duct tape. So you'll be able to see exactly where those are and, uh, where they are in relation to any of those, again, turns, climbs, descents, anything like that. Sometimes, uh, Ironman likes to put, uh, aid stations in some, uh, odd places. Uh, sometimes they're right in the middle of a climb or right in the middle of a descent when there's a nice long flat right before, right after, but, uh, just go and see exactly where those are. And then be sure to check out the athlete guide again, inaugural race, several new things. Uh, what are the nuances of this race? And, and, and basically, uh, since none of us have had the, uh, opportunity to do this race before, it's going to be new for everyone. So make sure that you have studied up on that athlete guide and you know exactly what you need to do, what you're in store for and how things are going to go. All right. On race morning transition opens bright and early at 4 30 AM. Uh, there is no parking or shuttles to the swim start. Uh, so that means you're going to have to take about a mile and a half walk uh, down there to the swim start from the transition area. So uh, the race actually starts at 6 a.m. There's only about an hour and a half between the time the transition opens and the race starts. So make sure that uh, you get down there and, and have plenty of time to do everything it is that uh, you're going to need to do and, and don't rush uh, and not be in a rush. Uh, rush if you have to, but uh, hopefully if you have planned accordingly, then uh, you won't you won't need to to rush. Uh, the water temperature is uh, going to be announced in the days leading into the race. They'll be taking uh, measurements generally each morning and posting those um, at the check-in table. So you'll have a good idea of of what uh, the race day temperature is going to be. Likely going to be in the upper 60s. So that's well below the uh, wetsuit cutoff of 76.1 degrees. So again, anything at or below 76.1 is going to be wetsuit legal. Vast majority of athletes will be wearing um, a wetsuit. And again, chances are the temperature is going to be in the upper 60s. So um, it should be wetsuit legal. So not really a decision here that that plays in. Obviously, keep an eye on on the weather. Uh, probably don't have to tell you to to monitor the weather as race day approaches. I know triathletes are are known for obsessing over the weather and for good reason. Uh, but uh, chances are it will be a wetsuit legal race. As mentioned, the race starts bright and early at six a.m. So early start, early finish. All right, on to this lovely swim course. So the swim start, uh, again, about uh, about a mile and a half up the road from the uh, transition area. Yes, it is a 1.2 mile swim, but uh, it's a little bit longer walk uh, to get there just based on where the transition area is and uh, where the swim exit are. Uh, so it actually starts up at the North Riverfront Park. Uh, so you can see here there's a, uh, a ramp down there into the water. Uh, with with a small dock out there. It is a self-seated rolling start. So again, you will be uh, lining up according to your expected swim time. Uh, with that rolling start, they typically have anywhere from three to five athletes going into the water at a time, um, approximately every three to five seconds in between those. It is what we call that beach entrance. So uh, it is kind of just a nice, easy um walk down there into the water and a uh, nice easy start from there. So a couple tips for the swim start, uh, get queued up early. So uh, as already mentioned, uh, there's only an hour and a half between the time the transition opens and the first athlete enters the water. So make sure that you are getting down there uh, to the race site with plenty of time to get parked, get over to transition, get everything set up in transition, and then have uh, you know plenty of time for that mile and a half walk uh, down there to to the swim start. So again, no shuttles, no parking uh, down there at the swim start. So um, you're going to have to to foot it down there. Again, 
uh, more time on the legs and on the feet. So uh, would recommend bringing some hydration uh, with you uh, as well as nutrition on that walk. Um, so again, we want to just stay topped off with the hydration and our nutrition. Um, so even just your morning protocol planning, make sure to take that into account as well and bring that uh, bottle, maybe with some calories and electrolytes with you on that walk uh, down there from transition to, to the swim start. Uh, don't queue slower than expected. So uh, everyone's going to be lined up. It's, it's going to be a, a, a nice long line with all the athletes that are racing. Uh, typically, there are signs every five minutes. So it starts with 25 minutes and below um, and goes up uh, from there all the way to those that are an hour plus. Um, so get as close to your actual expected time as possible. This is going to um, help you uh, in your swim. You're going to be swimming with less contact, swimming over fewer people, being swam over by fewer people when you are uh, ag- when everyone is accurate with uh, with their time. Now this is a downriver swim. Um, so, uh, hopefully it'll be a nice and fast, uh, swim. So hopefully everyone is exceeding their time, but hopefully everyone is exceeding their time, um, by an equal margin. So, uh, when we are, uh, lining up with those expected times, it's, it's kind of removing any current, uh, that the, the benefit you may receive from the current. So what is your normal, uh, current free, uh, 1.2 mile swim time, uh, go based on that. Um, and don't go slower um, than expected. So a lot of times uh, what we'll see are athletes who, who are kind of timid. They're a little nervous about getting in. Maybe they want to hang back with their their friend or training partner. Again, um, when when that happens, uh, you know, that's that's where you're going to have more contact, more traffic. Um, so, uh, don't, don't queue slower than expected once in the water. Don't panic. I know that's easier said than done. Um, but, uh, it's, it's a good idea to take just a little bit of time, do what it is that you need to do to be comfortable getting into the water. Um, so just settle in, you can get in some sink downs. So, uh, just take your time getting in and getting started. Uh, sink downs are, are just that where you sink down under the water, blow the air out, rise up and, uh, just be reminded that, um, there is plenty of oxygen above the surface of the water. Um, do what it is that you need to do to be comfortable starting, um, that, that swim course. Again, taking that minute or two early on will really pay dividends later on as you, um, are able to successfully swim. So the swim course uh, is is quite simple. It is a point to point uh, from that uh, the the start there at the, the North Park, heading down to the South South Park. There are two bridges that you will cross over, which uh, those are going to provide some good sighting opportunities, as well as um, uh, as as uh, objectives to to reach and then to uh, exceed. So uh, you will head over to uh, the finish shortly after crossing over that memorial bridge. Um, I am get quite confident you'll be able to see that bridge for the majority of the time uh, from the swim start. So you know exactly where you're headed, exactly how far uh, that you you need to go. Uh, keep in mind the sunrise will be to the east. So uh, as this is somewhat of a southeastern direction. Um, there will be a a decent amount of sun that you're swimming into. This is going to be uh, present as uh, when you're sighting, um, especially. And um, for those that uh, I would say breathe to the left are going to experience perhaps a little bit more of of this sunrise than those that breathe uh, to to the right. So a couple tips for the swim course. Uh, Consider the sunrise when choosing your goggles. So again, uh, it is going to be real important to uh, be able to sight off those buoys, off those bridges. Um, but when the sun is low, again, 6.30 start. Uh, so kind of depending on where you are in that queue, um, that sun could be and, and likely will be quite low in the sky. So uh, perhaps have a little bit darker mirrored uh, goggle so that uh, you're able to um, see those despite having that, that sunrise basically in your face. Break the course into segments. Now, this is just a straight point to point, so uh, a little bit more difficult to to do because we don't have the turns and that sort of thing. So what I would do in this case is just every buoy is buoy to buoy. Um, That's typically, for me, the best way to to go. I like making small achievements. um, And before you know it, when you swim buoy to buoy, all of a sudden you're at that last red buoy and you're turning there into um, 
the finish area. Be sure to sight often. Uh, the quickest way to uh, swim long uh, is, is to swim crooked. Um, and when you don't sight often enough, that's when you end up uh, swimming, swimming crooked. Uh, start getting over early. So shortly after you have crossed under that memorial bridge, start looking for that red turn buoy and uh, start getting over to it. Depending on how strong that current is, uh, it may be a little bit difficult to uh, swim towards the shore. Don't want to overshoot the finish and swim any further than necessary. So again, once you cross under that memorial bridge and, and start to see that uh, that last red turn buoy, start heading over to it and then enjoy the swim. It should be nice. It should be fast. Uh, you should be able to get some benefit of, of being both a wetsuit swim and a downriver swim. So this swim has PR written all over it. All right, going to head into transition in the park. So my understanding is that the swim exit is via these uh, stairs here. Uh, so you'll be climbing out onto this beach area, up the stairs, and then down through this. Uh, uh, this is a newly um, completed renovation, uh, upgrade by the city of Springfield. So it's going to be really nice, great place for their spectators to hang out. And then the actual transition area is a little bit further down. Um, so tips for transition, know your location, so tips for transition, uh, know your location. There are going to be a lot of bikes, a lot of racks. Those racks are going to look largely the same. Uh, the, the bikes on that uh, rack are all going to look uh, pretty darn similar. And in kind of the fog of race day, it may be difficult to find exactly where your bike is. So especially in that day before the race, when you're dropping off your bike, pay special attention to where it is, uh, which row you're on, any landmarks that you can use, whether it be a light pole, a trash can, something like that that uh, can stand out so you'll know exactly where your bike is and you can get to it as quickly as possible. Uh, also, we want to be efficient in our, our motions, in our movements, in our task in the transition area. And along with that is packing minimally. So pack everything you need, no more, no less, and know exactly what those items are. So obviously you got to have a bike helmet. Um, and then from there, it's kind of up to you what else you're going to have there in your transition area. But uh, try to keep those things to a minimum. And then be sure to practice and rehearse your transition uh, in advance. The, the more uh, versed you are in this, the better off you're going to be, the less inclined you're going to be to forget anything, the less inclined you're going to be to fumble through. But uh, again, we want to be very efficient and intentional with our transitions. We don't want to be in a rush because again, when a rush is uh, a rush is when, uh, you know, bad things happen. We tend to fumble with things and, and not uh, really be present. But uh, when you have that well rehearsed transition, that is when um, things happen uh, right. Um, so be sure to practice that in advance and consider a go bottle. So go bottle is, is one of my favorite tips, uh, that came to me years ago from, uh, my friends at precision fuel and hydration. Uh, so a go bottle, I have one in T1 and one in T2. I've, I've talked, uh, already, and I'm going to talk more about the importance of hydration, nutrition, electrolytes on, on a race day. So at this point, you've had that long walk from the transition to the swim start, but again, hopefully with uh, maybe a bottle in hand, getting in, uh, some of those as we headed down to the swim start and then you swam for, for give or take 30 minutes, head over to transition, no nutrition taken into that time, but you've gone through calories, you've gone through hydration, you've gone through electrolytes. So this go bottle is, uh, just, uh, six to eight ounces of, of water. I do a full serving of my electrolyte mix and a full serving of my calories. And I get that down real quick as I'm going through my other task in transition. So it's just a good primer as I head out onto the bike. I've got, uh, some, some hydration, some nutrition, some electrolytes in there. So, uh, again, I like to use those, uh, vitamin water bottles. Uh, they have a nice big mouth on it that I can chug down that six to eight ounces of water real quick. Um, much quicker than if, uh, you were just to use one of those standard water bottles with a much smaller, um, mouth on it. So kind of, I'm using those vitamin water bottles, uh, to stay hydrated, hydrated, uh, in the days leading into the race. And then I repurpose those bottles, uh, as my go bottles in transition. All right. Headed out onto the bike course. 
So uh, bike course is one loop in a clockwise direction. Uh, Going to have generally good road conditions. But again, what does that mean? Diff- something different for me, something different for you. So um, make sure that uh, you go out and pay attention to those things when you go preview the course. Again, it's going to be, uh, I definitely recommend going out and driving the course to see exactly what good uh, road quality means. It is a rolling course with several 2% climbs. Uh, so 2% is, um, it's definitely not flat. Uh, it's not a super steep uh, grade, but there are several out there on the course that are going to get up to 2%. 2%, you're definitely going to feel, you're going to know that you're going uphill. It is going to uh, require an increase in output and likely a reduction in cadence. But again, go out and see exactly what I am referring to when I say rolling with several 2% climbs. It does go in every direction uh, multiple times. You can see it's almost like a, a spaghetti map here with a big circle. Um, if sure, if we stared at this long enough, we'd uh, we'd find something to say that this uh, course looked like. Uh, but uh, yeah, it kind of goes all over. So regardless of which way the wind is coming from, uh, you're going to get it all four directions because the course goes all four directions and then some. It is a net uphill on the way out. So the first 29 miles, you can see from this uh, elevation chart, have a net uh, incline. And then pretty quick, there's a drop with a net downhill on the back half after mile 29. So if we were to uh, kind of dissect the course here in the middle, uh, that mile 29 is going to be right at there, uh, kind of on uh, that westernmost point. So basically we're getting out there uh, to that western point and then headed back uh, with, with a net downhill. Uh, there are two pretty significant climbs out there. Again, go see what I mean when I say pretty significant. Uh, the first one is approximately a mile long with an average incline of 3%. So uh, as I mentioned, 2% is a uh, pretty legitimate climb, pretty good climb. You're definitely going to feel it. So 3% is is all the more. Uh, that is right along this section here, uh, approximately mile 18, mile 19, somewhere in that neighborhood. And it is about a mile long. The second uh, is a little bit further up the road. Uh, climb number two also is a mile long, but it averages a 6% grade. So already established 2% as a, as a pretty good climb, 3% is 50% more of that. We're now going to double that going from 3% climb to a 6% climb um, on, on this section. So it is right up here on this. So we can see that on the elevation chart. We have the first climb here. Uh, second climb here. So we can obviously see it, it is uh, quite steep. It somewhat levels out from there from uh, that uh, approximately mile 24 through mile 29, where then a uh, nice steep downhill, uh, another little uh, bump up, but then largely headed downhill on the back half of that course. So uh, be a nice, um, nice downhill into the uh, transition area. So a couple tips for the bike course, uh, be familiar with it. As mentioned, already said, go out and see it, see exactly where these climbs are, how steep they are, how long they are, uh, know exactly what you're in store for. No surprises on race day. Uh, to, to say it again, uh, stay ahead of hydration and nutrition. Um, it's going to be very, very important uh, that uh, you stay up on those. 70.3 is a long day. You're going to be burning a lot of calories. You're going to be sweating out a lot of hydration. Uh, so make sure that you are staying up on those. Be patient on the climbs. Um, the, the, the most efficient way to, to attack a hill is uh, to be patient early on. And, and when you're going to push, that is going to be later on as you're closer to summiting. And you're going to be able to actually get the benefit of that increased wattage as you go over the top of the hill and then begin to uh, go down uh, the downhill. So a rolling course like this, especially with these, uh, these steeper segments thrown in, if you go out and you attack every hill, uh, you're going to be doing a whole lot of work and not really producing a significantly faster bike split, but uh, that is very likely going to cause a significantly slower run split simply because you've uh, basically spent your legs out there on the bike course. So, so be patient on those climbs um, and um, then recover on those descents. So yeah, you're going to have to definitely put in some work to get up to the top of these, but the good news is what goes up comes down. Um, so, uh, take advantage of that, get up to speed and then kind of spin out the legs 
and uh, allow the heart rate to, to come down. Along with that, it's important to fuel strategically. So um, on these, some of these climbs, some of these descents, it is going to be more difficult, a little bit less safe to um, be able to get in uh, your, your fueling. Again, very, very important. Um, so if you know that uh, perhaps one of these long climbs is coming up, uh, go ahead and get ahead of your hydration and nutrition. What we don't want to do is go through some of these longer stretches um, and have not taken in any any nutrition for the past 20 minutes. Uh, sometimes it can sneak up on you like that. And once you fall behind, it uh, then is very difficult to, to get caught up. So be sure to fuel strategically. And then uh, once you are enjoying that net downhill back into the transition area, begin to prepare for T2 as well as the run. So um Think about those things that you need to do in T2. What is your procedure? What is your protocol for T2? And then begin to spin out uh, the legs. So um, there is a physiological benefit to matching your run cadence to your cycling cadence. So most people are running somewhere around 90 steps per minute. Um, so in those last several miles of the bike, if you can uh, match your um your bike cadence to your expected run cadence, that's going to remind your body exactly what it needs to do and what it feels like so that when you come out of T2, uh, you'll very quickly establish that uh, that good proper run cadence that works for, for you. Uh, something else to note is um, personally, uh, my protocol is to stop taking in fluids with about 20 minutes left on the bike. I know I've talked about uh, this all day so far about how important it is to get it in and absolutely is. But for the last 20 minutes, I don't take in any additional fluids. And that's just so that I can go through transition and start my run with a settled stomach. What I don't want to do is take in a bunch of hydration, nutrition, fluid there late in the bike and then have that sloshing around in my stomach early in the run. So uh, my rule of thumb is about 20 minutes out. So somewhere in the neighborhood of six, seven miles, uh, I will take um, take my last big chug, especially if I'm behind, God forbid, um, I will do all I can to kind of get some down as much as possible. Um, but yeah, around mile 50, give or take, is when I'm going to take in my last fluid and then um, head into the transition area. So once again, nice, lovely park that is uh, re newly renovated. The transition tips for T2 are exactly like the transition tips for B1 uh, for T1. Uh, know your location, know where that rack is, uh, be efficient, pack minimally, practice in advance so that you can move through there uh, quickly and efficiently, and consider a go bottle in T2. So uh, the main difference for that go bottle in T2 uh, is I have a little bit more in it. So again, that T1 bottle is six to eight ounces. My T2 bottle has more like 10 to 12 ounces in it. Still a full serving of electrolytes, full serving of nutrition. And uh, I have the advantage there of, of it truly being a go bottle. I can take it with me out there on the course. So um, kind of depending on how I feel, depending on how my stomach feels, I may just go ahead and uh, chug down that full 10 to 12 ounces, get ahead on that hydration, nutrition, electrolytes, or if I feel like I'm not quite ready for all of it, I can take it with me um, and carry it out there and, and kind of nurse that bottle over the first half mile, mile, two miles, however long uh, it, it takes to, to get it all down. Um, and from there, I will then switch over to, to the on-course nutrition. All right, headed on. This is going to be a neat run course there, very urban on this trail system right along there outside of downtown Springfield. So uh, it is a two-loop course, uh, mostly along the path. So um, really nice system there along the riverfront. So it's going to be um, quite nice. And uh, there is some shade, but it's mostly exposed to, to the sun. So be aware of, of that, especially if you are more susceptible uh, to the effects of the sun, like I am, uh, the course is, is almost completely flat. Um, so, uh, uh, no more Hills after you come off the bike into transition, it's going to be a flat run. So, um, it is two out and back sections, two times. So, uh, we basically can cut this, uh, course into kind of fourth. Uh, so it's going to start heading out to, uh, the North. This is going to be retracing that trip from transition down to the swim start on race morning. Um, then hanging a, a left, crossing over the bridge with a little bit of a loop, 
heading back down, uh, back to the transition area, back down to the south with a U-turn there uh, along the, the course there, headed back up, and then we're going to do that all over again. So back up and over, back down, back down, and then head over a little loop and head into the finish line there, more so in the downtown area. So uh, a couple tips for the run course, uh, build throughout. Um, so as I mentioned, it's real easy to divide this course into fourths. So that section that uh, starting off to the north, then back to kind of the transition area, down to the south, back up and that's gonna be done uh, twice. So you can actually divide it even into eighths, kind of depending on uh, how small do you wanna take these bites of, of the elephant, whatever works uh, for you. So uh, I always recommend that um, you you begin the run uh, on, on what should be really felt like a, a almost constrained um, pace. It should be very easy, not pushing yet. Uh, get get your legs, establish a feel for, for the course, for the day, how are you feeling? Uh, and really hold back. So I would say in that first segment, maybe it's just that first segment to uh, to this U-turn point. Maybe it's the first out and back, um, but but have a, a really, um, really restrained pace. Hold back maybe 10, 15 seconds uh, slower than, than your goal or expected pace, and then begin to build. So maybe on that next section, uh, you begin to build, you kind of test the legs. How are you feeling? Uh, making sure that you're good on hydration and nutrition, and you can increase that uh, pace throughout until uh, at the very end, uh, you're actually running your fastest of the day. When you um, properly pace and you also nail your nutrition, your hydration, your electrolytes in your cooling protocol, you actually can uh, run that 13th mile faster than the first and, and their 12th faster than the second uh, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of the objective is to have that negative split to build throughout uh, the course and then leave it all hanging out uh, there at the end as you sprint down there in that last segment. Uh, already said it numerous times, uh, but it is going to be critical on the run course that you stay hydrated and stay cool. Um, so uh, this is going to be a cooler race, uh, even though it is into the summer months of June there in, in, in Western Massachusetts. Uh, it's going to be warm enough uh, where the temperature will likely affect your ability to perform. So, so don't sleep on this just because it is uh, not a particularly hot race, uh, don't sleep on this and ignore the fact that it is still going to be warm or, or is, is uh, expected to be warm. Obviously, the forecast uh, can, can certainly change between now and race day. But um, as your core temperature increases, your ability to perform decreases. So this is one of those things that is critical to manage. This is right along there with your hydration, your nutrition, and your electrolytes. You have to manage your, your core temperature. When your core temperature goes up, your ability to perform goes down. So uh, this is going to start on the bike. So my recommendation is to take a cold water bottle at every aid station. And what I will do with that is as soon as I get that cold water bottle, I will take a nice long draw off of it and drink as much of that cold water uh, as I can. I will then spray my face, my body, my kit uh, with that cold water and then take another nice big draw on the bottle getting... Um, getting in as much as I can there. So I'm cooling my body both from the outside as well as the inside. So even if I have a, um, a, a bottle with, with water in it, I will go ahead and ditch that in the, in the trash zone um, and always take that cold water bottle every opportunity that I get. Same thing out here on the run course. Um, at those aid stations, I'm going to be taking um, ice and water, chewing on the ice, drinking the cold water, and then shoving that ice everywhere I can under my cap, down my jersey, down my shorts, um, whatever I can to help cool the body again, both from the outside as well as the inside. So recommend taking something from every aid station. So you guys have paid a hefty penny uh, in the entry fee. So might as well go ahead and get your money's worth. So um, there's, there's definitely an opportunity and a need every time you, you approach one of these. So um, my default uh, long course nutrition protocol is I take a gel at every other aid station. That is what I have found works well for me. So I know when I come up to that first aid station, I'm going to take a gel and then I'm going to get two cups of water so that I can rinse that down and uh, allow that osmolality to, to work. Um, and then from there, 
on that other, uh, what I would refer to as that off aid station where I'm not taking in nutrition, that's where I'm really going to focus on my cooling protocol. So, um, getting that ice, getting it down my kit, uh, getting that water, uh, pouring it over myself to help keep, uh, my body cool. So, uh, again, chances are there's something that you can take at every aid station that is going to benefit you and then be sure to plan your aid stations as well. Don't just get up to that aid station and, and feel like you're at the all you can eat buffet and just decide, uh, what do I want? Maybe I want this. I want that. As you're approaching those aid stations, make those decisions, do that analysis to see what is it that I, my body is craving. What do I need? What can I take at this aid station to benefit me and set me up for success on the rest of this run course as we head into the finish. So, uh, speaking of the finish, uh, everything I've said to date is, is really about kind of maximizing your performance and getting the most out of your fitness. Uh, these not so much, these are just kind of fun. Um, as you head into that finish line, clean up, wipe away the blood, sweat, tears, the snot. Um, this is where you're going to be taking, uh, the pictures that you're going to be as your, your Instagram, uh, profile. This is, you're going to be on the live feed. This is where your support crew is going to see you. So, uh, ditch the cold towels, the sponges, zip up, uh, the kit and look good for, uh, the pictures, the videos, and your loved ones. Be sure to take it all in. Uh, that Ironman finish line is a, a very unique opportunity. It's a unique experience. You've worked hard for it. You've been training for months. This is really something that, um, is really worth taking in. So slow down just a little bit. Kind of my rule of thumb is at any Ironman event, once you step onto that red carpet, the race is, is over. So those that are, uh, trying to win the race, win their age group, go for those world championship slots. They're not listening to me anyway. Uh, sure. Those guys get across that finish line as quickly as possible, but for the rest of us, uh, really savor those, those last few seconds as you cross the finish line, listen for your name, uh, and, and all of that fun stuff, uh, find some space. So if you come in as, as part of a, a group, Uh, I would recommend just hang, hang back just a second or two, let them go and have their moments, uh, there in the spotlight. You'll enjoy it more. Um, now if there's been somebody you've been out there, uh, you you ran the last 12 miles together and now y'all are BFFs. Sure. Uh, share that moment together, but, uh, you know, plan, plan out your finish line and, uh, really enjoy it. And then kind of my rule is all the high fives. Uh, there's going to be lots of kids, spectators, family, all that there with their hands out. Uh, I think it's just a ton of fun to, to give out the high fives. Not everybody does some run right down the middle of that shoot to the finish line. But, uh, I, I think it's just a lot of fun to give out the, the high fives. I feel a little bad. I feel like I should have some hand sanitizer available for them, but you know, they know what they're in store for when they've got their hands, uh, hanging out there, um, over the finish line. All right. Uh, so that's what I've got. I hope that's been beneficial. I hope you, uh, find something in there that uh, you can use on race day. So, uh, again, we've got a few minutes here that I'm going to get to as many of these questions as I can. Just a reminder, if I do not get to your question here this evening, I will follow up with you, um, in the, the next couple of, of days. So, uh, first question, do I need any special gearing? Um, again, kind of depends on what your definition of special is. Um, for, for the most part, I would say no. Um, obviously there, there are those few, uh, relatively steep climbs, those, uh, 3%, 6% climbs. Um, so, you know, I, I would say if you have a super aggressive, uh, time trial setup, um, you know, maybe this, this would, uh, dictate, uh, switching to a little bit larger cassette, um, maybe even a different ring, but but probably not. Probably just a cassette would be sufficient. But um, if you're unsure, if you have the proper gearing, I would say this is a great conversation to have either with your coach or your local bike shop um, just to to ensure. Tell them, you know, I've, I've got this course coming up. It's got a lot of 2% climbs. There's a 3% for a mile. There's a 6% for a mile Is is my current setup uh, going to be good, uh, for that. And it's going to depend on, uh, the rider and all sorts of stuff. So there's not really a, a true rule of thumb so far as, as that goes, it's going to be, be a little bit different for, for every rider. So find out, um, what you have and what you need and make sure that those two things reconcile. All right. What if I get a flat? Um, unfortunately an event of this size, it's not, if it's, it's more like who is going to get a flat somebody out there when you get this many athletes, 
unfortunately, someone's going to be getting a flat. So um, it's important that you be self-sufficient. Um, so recommendation here is to carry a, a flat kit or whatever it is that you need to recover from from a, a flat and not only to have the proper equipment, but have the know-how as well. So um, be efficient in being able to change a tire. Uh, if you don't know now, um, practice over these next couple of days. If you don't know how to do it, again, check with a, a teammate, your local bike shop, even even consult uh, YouTube. There's there's plenty of great videos out there showing exactly how to um, how to change a, a tire. But um, there is neutral support out there. Um, this is a big loop. Uh, so those guys are going to be spread out. So who knows how long it's going to take uh, for, for uh, the support crew to get to you if you have that flat. Uh, if you're lucky, they may be right there and, and hop out and can get, your, uh, get your, your flat fixed and get you back on the road in no time. Uh, otherwise it could be, it could be a long time. And, and if they're helping other people and they're on their side of the course, yeah, you may be there on the side of the road for, for a while. So do what you need to do, uh, in order to be self-sufficient and be able, um, to change out those flats on your, your own. Uh, can I bring a bucket into transition? Um, you can, uh, I've certainly seen this, uh, done plenty of times. Um, there is a guy in my, my local triathlon community that he is one of the few members of the 400 club, meaning he has done over 400, uh, triathlons. And I always give him a hard time because he still transitions sitting on a, a bucket. So we always give him a hard time about being, uh, new to triathlon. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, he, he is very well established. He's fast, but he likes, he likes to have a bucket in transition. Um, so, you know, if that's what you need, uh, to get there quickly, easily, uh, also a lot of people will carry their gear in that bucket to and from transition to make it kind of easy. Uh, I, I would say that's, that's generally not a problem. Just make sure that the bucket is not, uh, interfering with those around you in any way. So, you know, that's really true with, with everything that we do in that transition area is we want to make sure that, um, we're not interfering with, uh, those around us that we are good neighbors. Should I wear shoes down there to the swim start? Um, I, I've not actually been able to see this path uh, from the transition area down uh, to the swim start. But this is a pretty long walk. Um, so I, I would definitely recommend something. That, that's a long way to walk uh, with, with nothing on, on your feet, whether it be some, uh, some slides, some shoes, something like that. Um, I did go back and look in the athlete guide to see if they were going to pro be providing morning clothes bags that you could take down there to the swim start. I did not see anything about that. So I'm assuming that there are no morning clothes bags. So what they will do in some races, and, and, and it, it may be included in this, it may just not be in the athlete guide. Um, they'll give you a, a bag at check-in. It's called the morning clothes bag, and that will allow you to wear some warm clothes or wear shoes down there to the swim start, whatever the case may be. And then uh, you'll have the opportunity to take those shoes off, take those warm clothes off, put them in that bag and they bring them back to you again. I did not see anything about that in the athlete guide. I did not see that anywhere. So my assumption is that is not happening, but if that does, that's what that is. So um, if you've got maybe a support crew member that's going to be walking down there with you, maybe you're able to hand them off, maybe just something old that you can can toss uh, down there. But, uh, you know, check it out and, and do what it is that um, you need to, to do. Should I run a disc wheel? Um, my default answer to this question is yes. Um, the vast majority of, of the time, I would recommend running a, a disc wheel. The, the two exceptions would be in extremely high winds, and, and I mean extremely high. Uh, the only race I'm aware of that does not allow uh, a disc is uh, Ironman Hawaii, and that simply is because you're on top of a mountain in the middle of the ocean where it is very, very windy and actually can become a safety concern. Um, so, uh, we, we don't have anywhere near that type of wind, uh, in, in the forecast for this. So that's not going to be an issue. The other would be in a very hilly, uh, course with a lot of climbing where 
every ounce of weight really becomes um, important to take into consideration. So again, yeah, there's some ups and downs on this course, but but not enough where the difference between uh, your disc or your regular rear, rear wheel are really going to to make a big uh, difference. So uh, the question I always get is is having to do with with that crosswind and getting blown around. Um, but that's kind of a misnomer uh, for for two reasons. One is that uh, your front wheel is actually going to be far more susceptible to the effects of the wind. You're going to feel movement in the front wheel much more than you will the back. Uh, and that is because that front wheel is hinged, whereas the, the rear wheel is, is fixed. Um, also, you have the majority of your weight sitting on that back wheel, so it's going to be more stable, whereas you only have approximately 30% of your weight hanging out over that front wheel. So uh, that front wheel has less weight over it, it's hinged. Um, so it is gonna be much more susceptible to the effects of the wind. So I would say if you've got the disc, go ahead and run it. All right, now I've seen several uh, several questions um, here about this, about uh, the sewage that was reported to be dumped into uh, the river. Um, I, I, I've seen the same articles that you guys have. I don't have uh, any insider information as to what exactly happened, but I do know that was, um, it was about a week ago, five days ago. I forget exactly when that was that uh, I saw that. So it has been several days um, and we have several days to go before race day. So this is a, a flowing river. This is not a, a stagnant pond or lake where uh, whatever has been dumped into it is just going to sit there and, and stagnate. Uh, it is a flowing river. So fortunately, in this case, whatever was dumped in, into the river, it should be moving uh, pretty well. It should be uh, largely, if not completely flushed out of the area and well downstream um, at, at this point. So um, again, I'm certainly not an expert on that. That's kind of my understanding. My assumption is it was dumped in a moving river. So that moving river is going to take it and flush it downstream. But uh, what I do know is um, that Ironman is very particular um, about testing water quality. Uh, there are um, certainly some, some venues on the circuit that um, have some pretty sketchy um, swim venues. So, um, they have been known to, to cancel races, uh, or cancel swims, not races, cancel swims because of, uh, substandard water quality. Um, so just, just know that the city is going to be testing the water. Ironman is going to be testing the water. And if there is any presence of anything, uh, that is going to be harmful, uh, know that, uh, they, they will adjust the race accordingly. So I, I've seen that in the past. So I, I have, I have faith in them, uh, to, to certainly make sure that they are getting everything taken care of so far as that goes. All right. We are coming up, uh, on time here. And again, I want to make sure that, uh, I don't go over, um, any, any other questions that have not been answered. Again, I will follow up with those. Uh, but, but, uh, I, I like, I wanted to save this one uh, for last, any secret tips? Um, certainly not. Uh, you know, I always do my best to share all of my tips. I don't really keep any of them, uh, secret, but, um, my, my, my favorite tip, uh, perhaps is, uh, something that I have a conversation with all the athletes that I coach in the days leading into the race. And I always want to remind them or advise them to express their gratitude to their support crew. So, uh, very few, uh, Ironman athletes are an Island. It takes a village to, uh, help us and enable us to do what it is that we love, what it is, um, that we are passionate about. So, um, I, I always think it's a good idea uh, in the days leading into the race, just to send a text message, make a phone call, uh, sit down for coffee with, uh, your, your family, friends, uh, your coach, uh, co-workers that have covered for you, uh, basically anyone that has helped you along this way, uh, just express your gratitude to them um, and then carry that sense of gratitude uh, throughout the race week. As little things come and go, if you approach those with a sense of gratitude, that's going to minimize the the impact of, of those things. Um, and then when race day gets hard, uh, chances are you're going to think of those people. You're going to think of your kids, your spouse, uh, your, your coach and your support crew. Uh, and just the fact that, uh, you know, that you expressed your gratitude to them prior to the race is really going to be beneficial. And then I think 
um, it's important or, or, or really a good idea to express gratitude during the race. So out there on the bike course, if you go through a, a, an intersection that's being managed by police officers, just, just give them a quick shout out. Thank you. Same thing with, uh, going through some of those aid stations, going through transition, uh, those volunteers that are there, uh, enabling you, um, to, to do what it is that, uh, you're able to do. So a lot of those volunteers are athletes and I know a lot of you guys have volunteered. So, so you guys know, uh, re- those of you that are racing that have volunteered, you know, um, it's a lot of work. Uh, it's rewarding. It's fun. But, uh, the, the thanks from the athletes is certainly appreciated, um, as well. And then do what you can to, um, help your fellow athletes. So, um, sure. We're, it's an individual sport. We're all racing one another, but we're also, uh, to a certain extent in this together. And, uh, if, if you are struggling, if you're having a hard time, uh, if you can get outside yourself and help someone else, I, I am confident that that's going to be a great boost and uh, probably one of the best things you can do to to kind of re-energize yourself and get yourself back into uh, the race. So uh, again, we're right up on time here. Again, I, I want to respect uh, everyone's commitment here, but um, thank you for for your time. Again, I hope this has been a, been a beneficial to you and I want to wish you all the best. Hope you have an amazing experience. Good luck. Good night.